Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Battalion Chief Stephen Page from the Raleigh Fire Department, and you are listening to the SA Matters Radio Show with Dr. Rich Gasway. The SA Matters mission is simple. They want to help us see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Situational Awareness Matters radio show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of the show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high-risk, high-consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. Today's interview is with Peter Skank, who worked 32 years in aviation and also served as a firefighter and a police officer. Peter is uniquely qualified to compare the safety practices and mistakes of aviation, specifically as it relates to crew resource management and valuable lessons for the fire service. Some takeaways from this episode will include why crew resource management is so important for the fire service, the importance of strong situational awareness as the foundation of good decision making, the need to accept and promote the principles of crew resource management, the importance of understanding not only what is being said, but what it means, not just listening, and finally, the importance of accepting the input of all team members, regardless of experience. So let's jump into our interview. All right, Pete, well, let's, uh, let's start off by sharing with the listeners how we met. Do you remember? Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, at a conference in Wisconsin for firefighters, uh, primarily volunteer firefighters, and it was uh, going well, and I, I heard about this guy, Rich Gasaway, and I thought, uh, okay, uh, there's nothing else interesting going on, so I'll, I'll go to Rich's course. And uh, I sat there in the class, and I'm going... Oh my goodness, he's talking to me. <laughs> he's using aviation experience. He is actually applying what I learned in aviation to firefighting. And I had never thought of that concept before. It was completely foreign to me. And yeah. You, uh, for the listeners, frame it up, you have experience. Tell them what your aviation experience is. Tell them what your firefighting experience is, so they see that you come from both, both from both fields. worlds. Yeah, I was uh, I worked for Northwest Airlines for 32 and a half years, uh, best career I could have asked for, and uh, I uh, eventually got involved in various projects. One of which is called crew resource management, and this was a new concept <coughs> to the aviation community. But what we found in the aviation community is that aircraft are essentially a very safe tool. We found that the reason that planes crash is not because of mechanical issues, it's because of the failure of the human. Because we're involved, pilots in particular are involved in a very push button switching type mentality. And they get themselves into some situations that can be resolved, but not necessarily by pushing a button or flicking a switch. And that's what crew resource management attempts to do. It also is meant to improve the communication between the two pilots in the flight deck at the same time. And we found very similar or uh, problems in investigating plane crashes. We, we looked at 23 different uh, plane crashes and we listened to the flight deck recordings of these 23 plane crashes and we listened to not only what was said but how it was said and also what was not said and that really formed the basis for crew resource management 
It was in its infancy when I first got involved with it, but it's now evolved into one of the most important training uh, aspects of a pilot's life. What were, uh, what were some of the things that they were looking at as they were developing crew resource management in the early days? <clears throat> yeah, what, were, what were some of their focal points, you know, making sure that if they, if they were going to change the way they did something, what were they looking at? Well, I think one of the things that we looked at, and this is a very hard concept to evolve in the aviation industry, is the captain is not God on that aircraft. The captain can be questioned by the first officer. So in other words, making partners on the flight deck as opposed to a superior and an inferior. We found through uh, several plane crash investigations that we participated in that the inferior status of the co-pilot, and in this one particular case, um, the first officer, they felt so inferior to the captain that the captain could not be questioned. And he let that be known right off the bat. And they flew into a thunderstorm and they did crash. Not everybody was killed, but you still preventing every plane crash was our desire. And so we made everybody in the flight deck partners in the safe operation. And we taught them how to talk to one another too because we found there was a disconnect. Sometimes the terms that a captain would use, the first officer misinterpreted. And they were simple terms. It also addressed what is going on in the mindset of the pilots on the flight deck. And we had a, uh, an incident that did not result in a plane crash in which the captain said one word, but the first officer heard a different word. And it did create an incident, but it was resolved without, you know, many physical damage. Do you remember that example? Oh, I do. Uh, it's, it's a fairly long story, but um, the first officer and captain always used to fly together. And uh, one day the first officer's father died and he was very, very close to his father. So he took about a month off to recover from the deal. And the captain and first officer got back together the next month and they met in flight operations and they were discussing the flight and everything. And the captain noticed that his friend, and we'll call him Mike, wasn't really into flying today, but it's okay because the two of them had a connect that Everybody knew they formed one in cohesive team. They got out to the flight deck to the airplane, and it's normally the first officer's responsibility to walk around and do the inspection of the aircraft on the outside. Captain says, Mike, I'll take it. You stay in here. He did the walk around, came back to the cockpit, and Mike was just sitting there, hadn't accomplished anything. So they went through the pre-flight check, and, and Mike sort of missed some of the calls. They, uh, they did push back from the gate and they were about ready to take off. And um, they're sitting there and air traffic control clears them to take the active runway. So they pull onto the active runway and Mike is still not totally with it, but the captain knows that he will get with it. So they start accelerating down the runway and, and Mike's missing the call outs. They call out the speed, Mike's missing it. Mm. And, uh, and so the captain, uh, you know, is, is, you know, a little concerned about that, but he's also keeping an eye on the airspeed indicator. And he go, he just, without turning to Mike, he says, Mike, cheer up. And Mike reaches over and pulled the gear up. Well, the plane was fortunately flying fast enough to be in ground speed and they did a they were able to increase the airspeed so that the plane without contacting the runway was able to lift off but the captain specifically said gear up mike of course heard cheer or mike you know, the captain said mike cheer up mm -hmm. but mike was trying to get back into the game and he pressed the gear up now is gear up 
a term used? It's a common term used. So, it was an expected, <clears throat> yeah. but not at that point. Yeah. But it was expected. Right. So at some point, the captain would say gear up. Oh, yes. But just not that early. That's correct. And, he, and, and the, the, the co-pilot being distracted as he was, uh, and his mind on other things, was probably kind of in automatic mode and really wasn't processing the meaning of what the captain said. He just heard something that rhymed with gear, and there went gear up. Right. <clears throat> now, there's another incident in which uh, crew was flying along, and um, they were flying uh, Miami to Minneapolis, as a matter of fact, and uh, we're sitting there, and the captain radios, uh, we've just lost our number three engine. Well, the dispatcher looks at the weather ahead and says, okay, uh, let's... Uh, Let's turn around and go back to Tampa. And as the plane is on approach to Tampa, the uh, air traffic control calls up and says, where's the number three engine? Well, the dispatcher's response, it's on the right side of the aircraft. And so air traffic control says, so where is the engine right now? And it was at the first time that the company realized that the engine had actually fall, fallen off exactly as it's supposed to do when it has a you know, catastrophic failure. Uh, fortunately, the plane flew perfectly normal. The crew had no indication whatsoever that the engine had actually fallen off. It was just a routine landing on a 727. And, but it just goes to show you that the terms that we are so used to using in our normal everyday conversation cannot necessarily be transferred to our profession. Mm -hmm. And this applies no matter whether you're a volunteer firefighter or a professional flight, uh, firefighter. Mm -hmm. This is something that we all are affected by. Now, you as... Um serving in <coughs> excuse me both aviation and as a firefighter what are some of the applications of crew resource management as you were learning it in aviation um and then served as a firefighter were there applications that you said boy the fire service could really benefit from this or from this or from some connection of crm now you know the fire service is um since I don't want to say adopted, because um, that would be kind of presumptuous to say that it's broad application, but in some circles there's some efforts to bring crew resource management <coughs> into the fire service. What are some of the applications you see from aviation CRM over toward the fire service? Well, I think that what you're trying to do is perhaps as important uh, as what crew resource management has done for the aviation industry. When I got into the fire service and was going through all my training, it was put on a lot of water on the flames and the fire will go out. And I was in several situations in which I wanted to put the water on the flames my way and somebody else on the hose line wanted to do it in a different way. The end result is get the flame, get the water on the flames. Not necessarily. And look at what we're doing right now. They're showing that the smaller water droplets could be more effective than just dumping gallons and gallons of water on the fire. And in particular for the remote volunteer fire departments that have to shuttle in the water, this is a very important concept, and yet it's a concept that's very difficult to accept. It's just like trying to teach firefighters how to communicate with one another. And we had an incident with the uh, aviation industry um, in which um, an aircraft, a 737 aircraft, two engines, uh, over in England, um, they took off and the crew got a fire warning in the cockpit. And uh, it turned out, well, it didn't turn out this way, but the indication in the cockpit was that it was from the left engine. <clears throat> but then the captain looked down and looked at the instrumentation on the right engine 
and the right engine was actually indicating hot where the left engine was indicating there was a fire. The only way to do this to resolve which engine was actually on fire was to call the flight attendant up and ask her which engine is on fire. She comes up to the cockpit. Yeah. You can imagine how that conversation sounds. Oh, yeah. Captain calls the flight attendant up. She's, he says, which engine is on fire? Go back and look. And she looks, and it's, uh, it's not the left engine. And she turns around and she looks. Uh, it's the right engine. So she turns around and she goes back into the cockpit and she says, Captain, it's the right engine. He says, thank you, shuts down the power on the right engine, which was only the good engine that was running. What had happened was from her perspective, when she turned around, it was on her right side of the aircraft. When she turned around and went back into the cockpit, she transferred that information that was on the right side of the aircraft to the crew who then has a different perspective and shut down the wrong engine. Oh, and the plane did crash. Oh. Now, that happened to me. Not that catastrophic or anything, but I was running the panel on an engine on a pumper one day, and um, I had an obstructed view of the house that was on fire. And two, en two lines were run, one going to the B side, one going to the D side. Is the pump panel on the right side of the truck here, Peter? Is it mid mount on top? It's mid mount on top. <coughs> okay, but I knew which was going to the D side, and I knew which was going to the B side. And so, eat despite my obstructed view, I could even see the lines going out. Little did I know, they crisscrossed. Where the more experienced firefighter was going to the flames on the B side where the inexperienced firefighter was going to the D side to be act as a preventative. And when they called for power on the D side, I applied the power and knocked the firefighter on the B side on his butt. Mm -hmm. I saw it, I knew exactly where the lines were going out until they crisscrossed at that tree and I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And so communication has to be very clear and very specific. Nobody told me they crisscrossed. Firefighter wasn't injured, but it sure did impact uh, the you know knockdown. And I also heard about it like it was all my fault mm -hmm. later on. Hmm. <clears throat> um, recently in the news, the uh, plane crash in uh, the Alps with that pilot that got locked out of the flight deck. Um, <clears throat> it's not really the context of our, of our podcast to have a conversation about that, but since I have somebody who has an aviation background, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts about something like that that happens and, and how it perhaps could have been prevented? Because um, it's, you know, it's just so on everybody's mind right now, especially of people who fly. You know, I, I, as someone who flies, I look and say, holy cow, you know, could that happen on a plane that I'd be on? Well, fortunately, crew resource management addresses that. Um, it gave both pilots on the flight deck, and if there's three, it gave all three pilots the authority <clears throat> to question the other. We have had incidents, and they're not incidents per se, uh, but all airlines are finding out that if a pilot does not feel that he or she is up to flying that particular day, or if there's a medical reason why he or she should not be flying that day, all they have to do is say something. No repercussions, nothing whatsoever. It's perfectly permissible. 
there was a deal in which a flight crew took off um, from their departure airport and landed, and the captain called the company upon landing and said, I can't take this, I can't take flying with this pilot anymore. And the company handled it very appropriately. The, as it turned out, there were a difference of opinions on political views. And it was all okay to have a difference of opinion and it never per, uh, affected the professionalism of both pilots. And so after a few minute conversation with the company, <coughs> the, uh, the captain agreed to fly back and have the co-pilot replaced. As long as they merely talked about the professional and safety aspect of the flight. And it worked well. Mm -hmm. It worked very well. Um, one of the things that I learned along the way when I was doing my research from aviation, and there might have been a conversation I had with you or with someone else, is that it's not uncommon for the pilot and the co-pilot to fly for the first time together uh, on a flight deck because they are represented by two different unions, and so their bidding system for getting assigned to a flight actually follows two different pathways so that those <clears throat> pilots um, are assigned to where they're going to fly, not necessarily as a team, but independently, and then they might find themselves come together. Uh, is that accurate as I understand it? More or less. Uh, pilots typically bid uh, once a month. And uh, they're typically also represented by the same union. But because of seniority concerns, uh, a senior pilot may be flying with a junior co-pilot. Likewise, a junior pilot or captain may be flying with a senior co-pilot. It's, it's all a matter of preference. When pilots bid for their schedule, they sometimes bid to fly with specific other crew members. Um, but sometimes, most of the time, they bid for either days off or um, the destination. So yes, it's it it is possible and very common. But they tend they tend to meet up in the beginning of the month, and they fly together for virtually the entire month. The flight attendants, on the other hand, um, they have a longer work schedule, and so they may be on and off the pattern. Um, throughout the entire month. Okay. So as the uh, lesson, you know, as the lessons unfold from this uh, plane crash incident, um, <clears throat> is, there a, is there a process that, that pilots and co-pilots and flight attendants use to kind of assess each other to see if everyone's okay to, to be flying, you know, that particular flight? I mean, do they do any kind of... Uh, process of getting to know each other or something say it's their first flight together how to you know because i think about firefighters that come into the station to go on a call and they're maybe working right beside somebody who isn't uh <clears throat> you know isn't all in for that particular call and there might be some concerns if they knew about it is is there anything that they that they do in aviation that allows them to quickly assess whether you know the crew members are are fit to fly well essentially <laughs> what you, you said is, is true uh, what the crew does uh, before every flight is they get together um, in the cabin and the captain will go over the paperwork flight time turbulence uh, weather conditions things like that that everybody should know about um, typically after the guy, the captain is done speaking, uh, he or she will say something to the effect of, do you have any concerns? And uh, questions or concerns. The word concerns for 
one airline that I know of um, pays a particular, well, it lights fires, let's say. If you hear the word concern, <clears throat> that is a critical point to be paid attention to. So it's like a trigger word. Oh, it is a trigger word. You know, there are other trigger words that um, we use in aviation that I can't tell you about. But um, if you hear the word concern as a flight crew member, yeah, that's a very strong trigger word. It's perhaps the most significant trigger word you have. And out of that came the five-step assertive statement. And the five-step assertive statement is a way to resolve conflicts. And it's very powerful. I have written <clears throat> about the five-step assertive statement on the Essay Matters blog. So for any listener, if you go to the blog and you put in the term five-step assertive statement process in the search box, you will find uh, an article that I have written about that kind of details the steps of the assertive statement process and makes a fire service application to that process that you can um, then apply to your department, although I make some strong recommendations about how it should be first a policy, a policy then that everybody is trained on, because if you try to apply that process without to, with, to somebody who doesn't understand what you're doing, it could cause some problems. You're exactly right. And, and I won't get too much into the five-step assertive statement because I know you've written about it before. I know you had a podcast about it before. But it's a way to get somebody to listen to you not just hear you because there is a difference between hearing you mm -hmm. and listening to you mm -hmm. and and that's what the five step assertive statement is meant to do it's to get the other person to listen to you and then to seek a resolution so it's kind of like when you say i have a concern it's the equivalent of taking somebody by the collar and grabbing them by the collar and looking them eye to eye and say whatever you're doing stop and listen to me <laughs> More or less, yes, um, in, in a less violent way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's a very personal way to say that you don't honestly agree with them and that you want to seek a resolution because at the very end, that's what you intend to do. You present your way of seeing the situation and you seek a resolution. And I've always used the... Uh, philosophy that if there is a problem, then there must be a solution. And if you have a problem, before you present it, you must also have a solution. <clears throat> and it must also include the other person. Yeah. How many times I have spoken with firefighters, some on the podcast and some just in general, that had the concern, had the feeling that something was going to go wrong, but didn't speak up. They just held their tongue and held their breath and figured, well, if this person thinks it's okay, they've got a lot more years experience than me, or maybe they outrank me, and therefore it's not my job to speak up. I'm just, <clears throat> I'm just the firefighter. They're the officer. Um, yeah, what, what advice would you give under that circumstance? Well, this is one thing that crew resource management attempted to resolve because we saw that in particular in that one crash that I mentioned. Um, it was in Dallas, and uh, the crew, the plane flew right into a microburst, and the captain just was not paying attention to the first officer and second officer. It wasn't that... He didn't pay attention to him. It was the way they presented it. They said something like, lightning coming out of that one. And the captain responded, mm-hmm. And then somebody else said, uh, sure is going to get rough. And the captain responded, uh-huh. 
Instead, we would have liked to have had either the first or second officer say, that cell is going to cross the field during our approach. Let's go around. Make that suggestion. Now, that's a quick and dirty way of saying I have a concern. Mm -hmm. But now the process would be, I have a concern about that thunderstorm. Let's ask air traffic control to go around. Mm -hmm. What is there any tips that a firefighter could use, Pete, that you could think of that would get them to be able to get the attention of their officer? Uh, you know, say they make a say they make an observation of the officer, um, and they get the uh huh, um, or just a nod or just a grunt. <clears throat> you know, the concern doesn't go away, but how do they, you know, how do they chisel into the mind? Uh, you know, as you said, there's a difference between um, hearing somebody and understanding what somebody is saying. Is there is there a trick to this? Well, if the lead is intent on following a course of action, the first thing <coughs> that I think the other person should do is mention their concern and offer an alternative. Let's hold back. Let's wait. I have a concern about the safety of the floor ahead of us. Look at the color of the smoke. I have a concern. It's going to flash over. Let's pull back. <clears throat> And it's hard for a firefighter, I think, most firefighters, to pull back from putting out the flames. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to retreat. And yet you can retreat. And you can make a second assault. And if that assault doesn't work, it's okay to retreat again. <clears throat> does, it, <clears throat> does it work to ask... A question, uh, you know, for example, if, if a firefighter had a concern about the smoke maybe indicating uh, a, a pending flashover, that, the, that they would ask the question of the officer, so what do you see in that smoke? Or what is that smoke telling you to try to <clears throat> get them to pause and think critically about that particular clue? And what that clue is meaning, in other words, instead of um, guiding them to the answer, just ask the question and see if they can see for themselves maybe what they couldn't see just a moment ago. In the fire service, in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the attack, that would be ideal, but often, no, because... What you're <clears throat> essentially doing, or what the officer may feel, is that you're questioning his authority, his experience. Mm -hmm. Merely state, I have a concern that that smoke over there is indicating we're going to have a flashback. Mm -hmm. And that, that may get their attention. But if you ask, many people take questions as a questioning of their authority, mm -hmm. as a questioning of their experience. Instead, you may find something very significant that they may not have seen. Yeah, well, isn't the, 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 the questioning of authority and the perception of that kind of the foundation as to what led aviation toward the direction of crew resource management is that the captain was, you know, God on the flight deck and you were not to question that authority and, and, and to ask them uh, or, you know, to express your concerns? That was it. That was it entirely. And uh, when I'll be honest, when we first started teaching this course, we got a lot of comments that it's a touchy-feely class. Wrong. It's life. Mm -hmm. It is safety. And it's one of the most important <clears throat> concepts that people in aviation, firefighting, paramedics, let's look at doctors. When the doctor came to remove my right kidney, he didn't just 
cut out my right kidney, he made me draw on my body where the surgery was to take place because the perception of left and right could be different. And I knew which kidney I wanted removed mm -hmm. and I drew on my body which kidney to remove. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just had surgery a couple days ago or last week. And again, the doctor drew, since I couldn't reach my back, the doctor drew exactly where the surgery was to take place. Uh -huh. They've found a method for not operating on the wrong part of your body. <laughs> and, and now it's important for aviation as well as fire services in particular to make sure you don't go in and fight the fire, fight the battle using the wrong methods. Mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the crew resource management um, in aviation essentially had to change a culture. Yeah. Uh, how long did that take? Wow. Well, the program that we instituted was 18 months of research. However, we were aware that things had to change prior to that. I got involved not in the in-depth portion, but closer to the end. Um, the acceptance <coughs> of crew resource management uh, in the United States was very slow and I think all airlines experience the same thing in which we don't need to do this all we need to do is learn how to push buttons pull up gears and and uh, we don't need this and now it's mandatory yeah it's an annual training I had somebody um, I had a conversation with somebody in aviation and I we were talking about this cultural change and, and he said that it took a decade for the um, lessons of crew resource management to become um, standard practice, you know, to get through the, the change of a culture. It took a decade of training and retraining and, and you know, learning how to address concerns and how to develop this teamwork and as I recall him telling me, and you can you can you know validate this if you want, it led to some it led to some retirements because there were some people that just couldn't bring themselves to <clears throat> changing their mindset about how uh, you know how a flight should be managed you know by the captain. Did you see any of that stuff happening? Yeah, absolutely, um, and and I can't attest to the. Uh uh, resignations or early retirements or anything else like that but you got to figure that in aviation just as in the fire service you're dealing with humans and each one of us have a unique perception <coughs> of what the current is we had a our motto was change is inevitable growth is optional and that's so true because there were a client tell of those who would not change and we heard about it in the review process to those that say when can I expect more of this type of training and the goal was to take the clientele that said this is ridiculous and move them up to a, a, an area in which um, they can accept that we're all human. We're all human. Did all the pilot, did, did everyone, pilots, co-pilots, flight attendants, they all had to go through this training for CRM? We did that uh, training for pilots flight attendants, flight dispatchers, and other key personnel who interacted with pilots on a safety-related basis. 
And let me tell you, the flight attendants are there for safety. That's their most important job right now, is safety. Everything else is secondary. And so we had to have them involved. Mm -hmm. And and again, they were a little bit more interested in seeing that because when that cockpit door closes, we don't want the communication to end. Mm -hmm. We talked about verbal communication, visual communication, all aspects, barriers to communication, so that people that dealt with aviation safety realized that it's just not talking and hearing, <clears throat> it's speaking and listening. Mm -hmm. How long was a class when somebody took CRM training? Was it a half a day or a day? Or a day. A day? Yeah, it started out as a day. Uh -huh. And I've, I've been retired for a few years now, so I'm not sure how it is, but I know that um, crew resource management is a part of recurrent training uh -huh. for every pilot and flight attendant uh, as we go along. But the initial was one day. And would it be f fair to characterize the improvements in aviation safety <clears throat> to a big extent to the outcomes of CRM? Oh, I think so. I mean, for the first time in our history, um, we had one year in which there were no fatalities. Ever. Ever. And that was probably seven to eight years after CRM was initiated. And during incidents, we also find out the crews mention the importance of, uh, of what they learned in class. Mm -hmm. It's very applicable. Mm -hmm. It's very applicable. <clears throat> in, in, in closing, because well, we're running out of time, in closing, what advice would you give to firefighters with your experience in aviation and your experience as a firefighter um, maybe summarize our conversation in, in two or three takeaways of, of advice that you would give to somebody who'd be listening to the show. Crew resource management for firefighters is a new concept. I sit there and I listen to some radio transmissions I see some videos of mistakes being made that cost firefighters their lives, cause significant injuries. And every firefighter, no matter what department, no matter what fire, is at risk. And it's important to have many eyes and many experiences on the fire scene. You sit there and you watch a firefighter go through a, a roof and you sit there and you say, it's just a structure. There was something that I saw on the video that he situationally was not aware of and he should have. Accept and promote crew resource management for firefighters. It's a safety thing. The other thing that relates to crew resource management is the fact that people need to listen. Not just hear, but listen to what is being said and to accept, learn to accept the observations of others no matter their experience level. Good, we, uh, good takeaways. I'm taking some notes, so <laughs> I'm trying to get them all. I got, I got, <laughs> I got, I got five good ones there. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, when I, when I first attended your, your course, I 
didn't think very much of it. I mean, I know how to put water on a fire. But I was so totally unaware <coughs> of my environment, you know. And now, now we're being trained as firefighters to make observations as to what you see when you roll up. Everybody's going to focus on the fire, but what car is there? What person is standing by, taking videos maybe, you know? Where, what lines are down? Where's your hazards? We all have set routines that we go in and maybe turn off a propane tank or, or enter, you know, and we think that everything is perfectly safe. And yet situationally, how aware are we when we walk into a fire? Are you aware when you go into the front door that you're actually on the second level? Many firefighters aren't aware of that, you know. Is, is it fair to say that the class that you took, that I taught, um, changed or added to your perspective of firefighter safety? Yeah, but I had to catch on. I had to have an incident happen to me inside a burning structure that said I should have known better, you know. I had a ceiling fall on me. Mm -hmm. And it actually knocked my helmet off. <laughs> was that after the class? After you'd taken the class or before? No, this was before. Okay. But then I thought, this is so applicable. I wasn't aware of my situation. I was third on the line. I was on my knees. All I had to do was help advance the line. That was my sole responsibility. Part of the ceiling over my head collapsed. I should have noticed. I should have looked up. I should have looked around. And I didn't. And this timber did come down, knock my helmet off, and suddenly my head's exposed to fire. Oh. <clears throat> and did that come down on the other firefighters no, too? just no? me. Just you. Yeah. <clears throat> so naturally it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I assume you had an okay outcome for oh, that? Oh, yeah. 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 Fortunately, it hit my head. Uh -huh. Can't do any damage up there. <laughs> uh, did it disorient you or anything? No. No? No. Fortunately, I was quite well aware of what happened uh -huh. and uh, said a choice word um, and put my helmet back on and we brushed the timber out of the way and kept advancing. Uh -huh. But believe me, I looked up afterwards, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. All right. Well, um, thank you. Well, thank and, you. Uh, I, I love the, the tie and the perspective of aviation to the fire service. And uh, I think there's a lot for the fire service to learn from the lessons of the aviation. And knowing <clears throat> your well-rounded perspective and experience in both, I thought it was really worthwhile to, uh, to give you a chance to share, especially as it relates to the, th the early development of, of CRM. So thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. And I think you're right on, Rich. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Well, that concludes my interview. Thank you to my good friend and associate, Peter Skank, for inviting me into your home and for the opportunity to meet your grandson during my visit. If you're interested in attending an upcoming program, <clears throat> I will be in on April 14th at the New Hampshire Emergency Dispatchers Conference, on April 17th and 18th at the Saskatchewan Fire Chiefs Association Conference, April 21 to 25 at FDIC International in Indianapolis, on May 1 at the Priest River Regional Fire Conference in Alberta, May 4 through 8 at the Greenfield, Indiana Fire Department delivering a Company Officer Development Institute week-long program. May 11 to 14th at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington State, and May 27, 28 with the Frisco Fire Department in Frisco, Texas. If you're interested in attending an upcoming event, just go over to the SA Matters website, click on the blue box on the right side that says Upcoming Event Schedule. And here's hoping that we get a chance to meet up at a future event. I'm working hard to recruit new members to the SA Matters community of learners, and I'd like to have you as a member joining more than 5,000 people who are sharing situational awareness lessons 
and learning how to make better decisions under stress. Membership is free and you'll get a special report, 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. It's not a long report. It's more like a short white paper. It'll take you 10 or 15 minutes to look over to give you those, those best practices. If you're not a member, head over to the SA Matters website. Click on the red box on the right side that says Free Membership. As a reminder, every episode of the radio show has corresponding show notes page on the SA Matters website. The most recent episodes scroll on the home page for older episodes and to access the show notes, just go to samatters.com forward slash and enter the episode number, which I always mention at the start of each show. So for example, if you want to access episode 48, just open the browser, enter samatters.com forward slash 48, and that'll take you to the page it contains a link to the episode. You can play it right there on the desktop. Um, and there's also then a summary of the uh, show <clears throat> video audio if the guest provides that. You can also subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. And I'll mention more about that in a moment. If you want to get connected with me on social media, you can do that through Rich Ga- at Rich Gasaway or at SA Matters on Twitter. And thank you to the more than 14,000 who have connected with me on Twitter. You can also go to the SA, <clears throat> excuse me, SA Matters Facebook page and like that and look up Rich Gassaway on LinkedIn. Get connected with me there. Well, that's it. Episode 50 is complete. Thanks again to Peter Skank for sharing the crew resource management knowledge that you have with us. Thank you to our sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to the listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I sincerely appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. If you've experienced or witnessed a close call or near miss and would like to be interviewed on the show, just visit the SA Matters website, click on the Contact Us link, and I'll thank you in advance for sharing your lessons learned so others may live. If you like the show, please go to iTunes and Stitcher Radio and search SA Matters Radio, SA Matters Radio, and subscribe to the podcast and leave your feedback. If you like the show, I'd appreciate a five-star review. I'd, that would really motivate me, and it also helps others to find the show. If you're inspired and want to learn more about situational awareness, consider me becoming a member of the SA Matters community. It's free and you'll get that special report that I mentioned earlier. To claim your free gift, head over to samatters.com. Click on the red box on the right side of the homepage. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.